Well, good morning, good morning. Good to have each of you here. Uh, I'm not supposed to be here, but I am. And so just through circumstances and so forth, I'm here, Robbie is not. Uh, but uh, I, think, I think we're in good shape. I've kinda, Kevin's kinda gonna take over and so I want you all to take a little sheet and mark from one to 10 what you think about <laughs> one being lowest, 10 being the highest, and then we'll go from there. No, Kevin's gonna, uh, I think he's leading singing, he's got a solo, and you're preaching too? <laughs> That's what I say. That's what we're all saying, what? <laughs> but we're glad you're here. You know, it's good to have Sid Six out in the parking lot. Yeah. Uh, of course, the, Sid and Gail have been through it and um, we're thankful that they are out there. I do want to mention that Gwen Shriver's service will be uh, Friday here at the church at 11 o'clock. She passed away yesterday. And uh, so the service will be Friday, 11 o'clock uh, here in the church. And so be in, in prayer for the Shrivers this time. Let me make a couple of other announcements we need you to be aware of. Uh, last week we showed a video. We only did the first half. We're going to complete it tonight. And even if you didn't see the first half, the second half will really speak to you. It is fantastic. So tonight at six o'clock here in the auditorium, we'll be showing the, uh, showing the uh, conclusion of this video. No Wednesday night service this week. Also, uh, somebody's not meeting tomorrow. Who was that? No strings is not meeting tomorrow. Of course, this is Thanksgiving week, and so uh, a lot of those things are there. Uh, let's see, any other announcements we need to make? I think choir practice right after church in the chapel, and uh, we'll have that. Other than that, I think, how many boxes did you end up with? Shoe boxes? 140 shoe boxes. Wow. Thank you for giving to that. It's going to mean something to some kids somewhere in the world. And we may never hear about them here, but when you get to heaven, we may. And so thank you for uh, doing that. All right, I think that's all the uh, announcements that we have to, to make this morning. I have a word of prayer, and then I think Sharon's going to sing for us. Father, we come to you this morning thanking you, thanking you for all your blessings, especially this time of year when we look at Thanksgiving. We definitely need to be thankful, not just now, but all year long, we need to be thankful. So thank you. Thank you for keeping us together as a church. Uh, thank you for the many blessings that we have received in our personal life and the life of this church. And we are so grateful for our eternal life. So we pray for this service now as we go through the service that all things will be done to glorify your name. For it is in your name we pray. Amen.
is filled with thankfulness to him who reigns above, whose wisdom is my perfect peace, whose every thought is love.
about this uh, coming holiday is important to you folks as it has been to me down through the years. Thanksgiving. And we have so much to thank God for. You know, just before we pray, I'm not, I've got just a little tiny bit to say, a little tiny bit really. But I was reading Psalms 138 this morning. Four times we have in the exhortation to give thanks to God. Eight times we have the exhortation that it's to Him we give thanks. 26 times it says His mercy endures forever. Aren't you glad for that? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks. What else can we do? You have given us so much, everything we have, every blessing, even the trials that come into our life are used by you for our benefit, for your glory, and for our edification. God, we just bow before you and we thank you for who you are and what you've done for us. God, you're so great. And I just praise you and we praise you together. We give you thanks for this special time of the year. And Lord, we just want to bow before you and remember the greatest gift you have ever given to any man, any woman, any child. And that's a gift of salvation through the blood of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray, asking your blessing on this offering and your blessing on the service to follow. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, good morning. Why don't go ahead and stand? I want to read the uh, the scripture this morning and stand for the reading of God's word. I I uh, I really appreciate Pastor um, springing this on me this morning at about eight o'clock. No, just kidding. Um, I actually appreciate him uh, giving you all an assignment of giving me a score from 1 to 10 because I was really worried that once he said that I was going to be talking this morning that, you know, some of you might leave. Well, now you have a purpose. <laughs> now you can get us there and you can keep score on me today. So let's read our one verse this morning. And after the reading and prayer, then the choir will sing. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18. In everything... Give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this day. and We thank you for this week where we get to set aside and especially remember everything that you have done for us and give thanks to you. Lord, just be with us now as we open your word, as we study it, be with the choir as it sings here shortly. And Lord, just uh, guide and direct throughout this day. and May our hearts be open and attentive to what you would have us to learn. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Go ahead and be seated.
Christus. <clears throat> no, you're not going to get out of it that easy. The pastor said I had two hours, so settle in. In everything, give thanks. I suppose I should start off just by apologizing to Sid out in the parking lot. He came all the way here today, and he has to listen to me. So, sorry about that, Sid. Um, in everything, give thanks. This book to the Thessalonians, where we look at uh, a little bit of background here, and, and where Paul is at in talking about giving thanks. And we look at these first five chapters of of really the entire New Testament. The book of 1 Thessalonians is probably one of the first books, if not the first book written in the New Testament, uh, chronologically. And we look at the, the city of Thessalonica. And in Paul's time, the, the city of Thessalonica we, is the capital of the Roman province of Macedonia in the, the Greek peninsula on the north side of Greece. It's a prominent seaport. It's a strategic place in the country in the Roman Empire, as it was in the, the Grecian Empire, and it's a strategic place as a, a thoroughfare, a good place to start a church. Paul ministers to this population here, especially the Jewish population, we see it in, in Acts 17, and he's reasoning with them in the synagogue. The, the initial reaction of the Jews in that um, in that city, in that synagogue, is much like the reaction we see in many of the cities that Paul visits. There's a, a, a rejection, a rejection of the message of the gospel by the Jews. But we see immediately upon that the embracing of the gospel by the Gentile population in uh, Thessalonica and a conversion from their idolatry. We see the church being planted here by Paul. We see the, the date of this epistle is probably around 51 AD. And like I said, this is probably one of the first um, books written chronologically in the New Testament and followed shortly probably by Matthew and Mark. What we see here in, in one of these first epistles is these doctrinal foundations uh, that, of what it's meant to live for Christ and how living for Christ is dominant in this apostle, in this epistle, and in the follow-up letter to the Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians. So what is the context of 1 Thessalonians 5.18 when Paul says, in everything, give thanks? So this book, we only have to go back a chapter to see some of the more familiar verses that we're, that we're aware of in 1 Thessalonians about our hope in Christ, about his second coming, about our resurrection, that we shall not all sleep. Um, he says he doesn't want us to be ignorant in chapter 4 about these things, but to have hope in them. He personally reflects on his time with the Thessalonians in, in the first three chapters. He's encouraging to them. He's filled with joy when he receives the good report from Timothy about the strong faith of the Thessalonians. He gives them instruction on how to grow strong in light of the dark times in which they live, specifically in light of, in light of what they are facing. We look back in chapter 5 and verse 8, just a few verses prior to our text, and he says, But let us who are of the day be sober. Those who are living through times such as these, be sober giving encouragement to them. He also gives specific instructions throughout this book. Um, honoring those who labor among you, guarding the harmony of the believers, warn, comfort, support those who need it. Instructions to us as Christians, as fellow believers. Do good even in the face of evil. Rejoice, pray, and in everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. So what is this thanks, this thanksgiving, this gratefulness? Do we thank God for everything? <laughs> think of everything that's gone on in your life that's happened to 
to you. Do you give God thanks for everything? We look in 21st century America and we, we talk about this modern holiday of thanksgiving. And it is a dim reflection of what we uh, uh, see in our, our biblical history and our, our historical origins here in this country. Uh, rooted, the, the historical celebration of Thanksgiving rooted right here in the United States of America. You know, if we're going to peruse the meaning of the holiday, Thanksgiving, I, I think it's important that we look at what it means um, in the Bible, the biblical meaning of Thanksgiving, the origins of this holiday from the early settlers, the pilgrims, to today. So when the Bible says, in everything give thanks, we might be kind of prone to question that injunction. In everything? In everything give thanks. So not everything that happens to us is worth thanking God for, we might say. Is that the case? Now there's no question that many things that happen are evil, they're difficult. They're filled with turmoil, sorrow, tragedy. You don't have to look very far around us and watching the news and maybe even directly in our own lives to know this to be true. However, what we see here in Scripture, not just here but in several other passages talking about giving thanks, what the Scriptures address is our response to these things that happen to us whether they are good or whether they are bad. In one sense, we are not to give thanks for everything, but rather in everything. In the midst of every situation and in the midst of any situation, we should be ready to give thanks. Giving thanks to God in the midst of difficult events that happen to us is only possible if we have a right perspective. What do, we, what do we deserve? What do we deserve? We talk about this often in our Sunday school class. The grace of God. What do we actually deserve? Nothing. Nothing. What does God guarantee us? Is happiness an eternal right? The answers, we talk about rights a lot in this country. Is happiness an eternal right? Maybe the right answers to these questions can help us focus on the right perspective that we are to have. If we deserve nothing due to our sinful condition and our nature, then anything that we have should bring gratitude and thankfulness and thanksgiving. If God guarantees not happiness or good happenings to us, as we might define it, but instead the assurance that he has allowed what happens in order to build our character, then our perspective changes. We can be thankful for our circumstances and be in thanksgiving in every circumstance because God is good and wants us to build our character in those circumstances to do that. It is God in control of our circumstances, in his providence. We've talked about this several times in the last couple weeks in our class as well. God's providence over our life and our events that should help shape our perspective. If you have your Bibles open, turn back just a couple books to Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 11. Now Noah Webster uh, a great Christian and author, the beginner, I guess, of the dictionary here in America, Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary defines providence in a biblical sense. His definition is the care and superintendence which God exercises over his creatures. So let's read Philippians 4, 6 through 11. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth, passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. 
Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Therewith to be content. In verses 6 and 7, how do we avoid anxiety about our future? How do we get that right perspective of, of being thankful for the circumstances we are in? By praying with thanksgiving. Letting our prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, letting those requests being made known unto God. We talk to God to avoid that anxiety, to, to be careful for nothing. It cultivates a thanksgiving, peace of God, which passes understanding in verse 7. That is what keeps us. His providential hand, the God of peace, verse 9. The God of peace shall be with you. And yet, with all of God's care and providence in this world, this country, maybe even we as individuals, we become less and less thankful here in this world, in this country. We live in ungrateful times, don't we? We live in ungrateful times. Children no longer thank their parents for providing shelter, for, for providing food, clothing. Employees don't thank employers for providing them a job. Even church members often fail to thank those that serve them with sacrifice and faithfulness. Why is that? We have, we have perverted God's provisions into an entitlement guarantee. And we live in an entitlement society. I am entitled do this and this and this. And here's my list of the things I am entitled to. Why should I be thankful for something I am entitled to? You have to give it to me anyway. Why should I be thankful for it? Even TV preachers tell their viewers what they want to hear. Don't they? That God has nothing for them but health and wealth and happiness. What are they selling? Anything less, of course, than God giving you your, the much deserved and entitled health, wealth, and happiness, anything less than that would be beneath their status as a king's kid. This perverts both God's goodness and man's need. God is perfect. God is holy. God is righteous, owing us nothing. And we are sinful, perverted, warped, and we owe him everything. And if we don't start with the proper perspective and the proper relationship of who we are to who God is, then our giving thanks can only be selfish and limited. Giving thanks is our duty and our first response to our giver, creator. We ought to be thankful for each breath, for we have no guarantee of tomorrow. We ought to be thankful for those who serve us, and thankful for every meal, and thankful for even the most simple joys of life. And so when we look at this perspective of thanksgiving and thankfulness, let's look back quickly upon this country and the history of thanksgiving here in America. I mean, if, if it is God's will that we give thanks for even the most mundane of blessings so that we do not take them for granted and we maintain the best perspective, that will, that will not only help us, but it will help others. 
So does the Bible give us an example of actually celebrating a time of Thanksgiving as a holiday? The answer is yes, it really does. Um, we see the first Thanksgiving being celebrated and being instituted by God, and it's called the Feast of Tabernacles. Leviticus 23, this is the seventh of the seven feasts instituted by God, the first being Passover and the last being the Feast of Tabernacles. This was called the Feast of Booths, and it was during this feast that the Israelites were to make temporary shelters during the week-long celebration, being reminded of what it was like to live for 40 years wandering in the wilderness. It was called the Feast of Ingathering, Harvest. It occurred after the crops had been harvested, and it was a feast of thanksgiving, a feast of joy, celebrating God's goodness during their 40-year wilderness journey. This time of the, the time of this feast took place from late September to mid-October, so it's just behind us in our own calendar. So it's around the time of harvest. No work could be done on those days. This was a seven-day feast. It's one of the three seven-day feasts in Israel. The first being Passover and unleavened bread in the spring. The second being the 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 Pentecost uh, in late May, early June. And then the last one being the seventh feast, the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles in the fall. Each of these three were called the Pilgrim Feasts. And it was during the Feast of Tabernacles that Solomon's temple was dedicated. It marked the change of seasons from fall to the winter rainy time. The anticipation of rain was symbolized during the feast as a drink offering. The high priest with water from the pool of Siloam came to the southern gate known as the water gate. When he entered, three blasts were made from the silver trumpets. And with one voice, all the priests repeated Isaiah 12 and verse 3. Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. This went on for, three, or for seven nights. Uh, the, the recitation of the Psalms of Ascent and Descent, um, the lights of the temple uh, blazing with uh, multiple menorahs being lit, uh, lighting up the temple throughout the night. This was the Feast of Tabernacles. It was joy in the midst of suffering. Joy in the midst of pain and turmoil. It was not a feast that celebrated the absence of difficulty, it was a feast celebrating joy and gratitude in the midst of difficulty. How God sustains you through that difficulty. This is the perspective of the pilgrims as they celebrated Thanksgiving. Do you remember what they went through? Uh, sometimes we... We, we forget all these details of, of what these folks went through, getting to where they were, that led up to that feast in 1621. William Bradford is probably the, the second most, or the second but the most famous governor of the Plymouth colony. And he wrote a book called Of Plymouth Plantation. And there's a whole lot of detail in there of their many years of struggle leading up to that first Thanksgiving. He wrote that the wrath of King James descended upon them, and he, King James himself promised to harry them out of the land. They were being chased out of England. Um, yes, and it's the same King James that's probably on the spine of your Bible, who was chasing the the pilgrims out of England. He says, Bradford does, I may not omit the fruit that came hereby, for by these so public troubles in so many eminent places, their cause became famous and occasioned many to look into the same. And their godly carriage and Christian behavior was such as left a deep impression in the minds of many. And though some few shrunk at these first conflicts and sharp beginnings, as it was no marvel, yet many more came on with fresh courage and greatly animated others. Now imagine giving thanks to God here as he does in this book for publishing the cause of Christ at their own expense and growing their numbers because of it. Now would you or I be 
grateful. Grateful. In the midst of being betrayed, being put in jail, separated from spouses and children. And that's not all. The pilgrims thanked God the very next year in 1608 when they attempted to flee England again. The men had to actually watch their wives and children taken by the authorities while they watched from the boat. And the captain was fearing for his life, and that's when they sailed to Holland um, through a 14-day storm the entire way from England to Holland. And what was the attitude of the pilgrims? Through all of this, and their continued attempt to flee England and to reach Holland, and from Holland to America. Well, Bradford again says, but these things did not dismay them, though they did sometimes trouble them, for their desires were set on the ways of God and to enjoy his ordinances, but they rested on his providence and knew whom they had believed. Their philosophy was simple and it was biblical. Nothing happened to them that God did not providentially allow and promised to take care of them. Even through the midst of tragedy, they thanked God. An attitude of gratitude, knowing they deserved nothing, that kept them faithful to discern God's providential care in the midst of these circumstances. So if we look at this feast, 1621 as as we spring forward to 1621 as they have arrived they've gone through their first winter and many of them died in that first winter if you remember um and we'll catch some of that detail here in a bit but if america's tradition of thanksgiving is to be traced from every community-wide event that gave thanks to god we have hundreds if not thousands of instances of such activity long before 1620 we we'll always want to talk about the first Thanksgiving. It wasn't necessarily 1621. Um, so let's talk about what makes that first Thanksgiving, as we describe it, with the pilgrims. What made it unique? Why is this special? Because there were many Thanksgivings. So in the fall of 1621, the pilgrims, to call a day of Thanksgiving patterned after the after the biblical Feast of Tabernacles and mixing the joy of God's provisions with the sorrow of hardships endured in life. Their intent was to pattern their thanksgiving after the biblical feast. This was unique. And to top it off, it was done by inviting 90 native people from the, now I don't remember if I pronounce this right every time I say it, um, Wamponawag, I think, uh, from the tribe of natives. And those natives gave thanks to their creator long before the pilgrims, pilgrims arrived, not knowing who that creator was. But the pilgrim thanksgiving was unique in that it patterned itself after the feast of the Old Testament and introduced the Native Americans to their God. So how long did this feast last? What did they eat? Now we don't know the original date of this event, but it's probably in late October, in keeping with the original timing of the feast. Um, the day, this day and the, and the Pilgrim's Day is celebrated harvest. And so giving thanks to God is what their intent is, as Bradford identifies in his book. They feasted and they celebrated for three days. Now, try to imagine that just for a moment. Feasting and celebrating for three days. I'm, I'm pretty spent on Friday morning after Thanksgiving, usually. Um, I don't know how they do it for three days, let alone the Jews doing it with three separate feasts during the year for seven days. Uh, and actually, the Feast of Tabernacles at the end turned into an eight-day celebration. So the pilgrims and the Native Americans, they even had competitive games. Uh, they wouldn't have any idea what you know football games would be mixed in with Thanksgiving um, later on, you know, after 400 years of the celebration. Uh, I, think he, I think the Cowboys and Lions were still playing back in the 1600s and losing, by the way. Um, did I say that out loud? 
So for 400 years, the Cowboys have been losing on Thanksgiving. And it would be, honestly, except for that, it would be hard to miss some of the parallels we see with the Feast of Tabernacles. The tradition um, certainly has taken on more of a cultural flavor in England by this time, but um, we see a lot of uh, parallels with the Feast of Tabernacles, but some of those details, all the dishes were wooden and the children served the adults. And so remember that on Thursday. There were only, ladies, there were only four living adult pilgrim women alive for this feast, cooking for 140. They ate cod, sea bass, fowl, wild turkeys. Um, a lot of wild turkeys, by the way. And if you ever, ever hunted turkey, you know how fast those things are. And imagine hunting those uh, with the weapons of the time. Uh, there's even a legend that popcorn was first introduced by one of the Indians, but this can't be proven. Uh, recreations did not include NFL, but uh, it did include bow and arrow contests, military drills, foot races, wrestling. Um, Henry Morton Dexter wrote a poem about this first Thanksgiving. It says, we had gathered in our harvest and stored the yellow grain, for God had sent the sunshine and sent the plenteous rain. Our barley land and corn land had yielded up their store, and the fear and dread of famine oppressed our homes no more. As the chosen tribes of Israel in the far years of old, when the summer fruits were garnered and before the winter's cold, kept their festal week with gladness, with songs and chorals, choral lays, so we kept our first Thanksgiving in the hazy autumn days. And all pointing back to God. So what has happened to Thanksgiving in America? Hmm. <laughs> it's become lost. Public calls for prayer from either church or state or both become an, became an annual part of the calendar in New England for almost 300 years after this 1621 event. More than 300 days of public fasting and prayer coupled with Thanksgiving days for answered prayer occurred between 1607 and 1800. That was more than two a year. The act of celebrating during a harvest festival was brought by the pilgrims from England. The idea of thanking God for what he had provided in the fall and in the midst of hardship and difficulties marked the pilgrim idea of giving thanks as unique. This coupled with the need to publicly repent when calamity was allowed by God and then and thank him when he answered those prayers are all a part of the fabric of American society and culture going back to the early 1600s. And don't we have a lot to be grateful for in America? Now these were two types of Thanksgiving days that we saw. They were calling for day, public days of humiliation and prayer and fasting and then there was also the calling for days of Thanksgiving for answered prayer can, that these both continued throughout the colonies up until the Continental Congress. The first national Thanksgiving was called in the year 1777 by the Continental Congress to thank God for victory at the Battle of Saratoga. The Continental Congress issued its annual Thanksgiving proclamations each year through 1784 when the war was finally over. And then it was in the first session of Congress under this new constitution, a resolution was given to President George Washington on September 25th, 1789, indicating the will of Congress. Quote, to wait upon the President of the United States to request that he would recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many signal favors of Almighty God. In fact, when Washington became president, his first official act in his administration was proclaiming a day of thanksgiving, November 26th of 1790. Oh boy, one, three. 
trying to remember. Abraham Lincoln. You know, from the time of George Washington through the Civil War, amazingly, there were no national proclamations. And it was Abraham Lincoln that proclaimed the National Day of Thanksgiving for November 26, 1863. Today, for the 75 years following uh, Abraham Lincoln, there were annual Thanksgiving days proclaimed by every president. Franklin Roosevelt in 39 moved Thanksgiving one week earlier than the last in November out of pressure from merchants who wanted more time for Christmas. <coughs> Congress, however, in 41 disagreed and moved it back, permanently setting the fourth Tuesday in November as a national day of Thanksgiving. Merchants today, however, you can go into any Walmart and you see what? Uh, in, in, the middle of, in the middle of October, you see it decorated with orange and black. On November 1st, it's decorated in green and red. Uh, Thanksgiving has become an afterthought. Um, Thanksgiving is ignored uh, and like the, the lack of honoring Christmas as being the birth of Christ it, it does not honor Thanksgiving as a day to give thanks to God but it's rather a time to sell more stuff the demand for gifts at Christmas has almost obliterated the source of blessings our nation is in desperate need of returning to a true commemoration of thanksgiving. First, we individually, we need to restore God back into his rightful place as the primary object of our thanksgiving. He and he alone is worthy of our thanksgiving. Secondly, we as a nation need to restore the notion of giving thanks to the God of our forefathers, the God of the Bible, and the ruler of the nations. In the midst of difficulty and the threat of terrorism, disease, personal trials of all kinds, we must see the providential hand of his provision, especially in this, the richest nation on earth. It is time that we publicly acknowledge God without fear or apology. After all, isn't it his provision that has brought us to this place of being the most prosperous place on earth, the most prosperous people on earth, and we can't acknowledge him publicly? Finally, we must restore the days of prayer and humiliation and repentance and the giving of thanks to God that were historically done for hundreds of years in this country, on this continent. The responsibility for calling those days of fasting, prayer, and humiliation, repentance for sin, falls on those of us who call themselves by his name, believers in Christ. We should be asking God to forgive us of the specific sins that have plagued our sins in our land. We must ask God for forgiveness. May we as Americans remember to give thanks to God for the blessings we enjoy. Forgetting the source of our blessings and the source of our liberty yields pride in ourselves alone. As most public proclamations throughout our history have admonished us to humble ourselves before God, I hope we never succumb to being that nation of ungrateful people who think that by our hand alone we have achieved greatness. And that's really where we're at. If you're not thanking God, then you believe that you are the source of your own success and prosperity. It is not the fact that we are Americans, but the fact that we have humbled ourselves enough to give thanks to God from all 
races out of place of equality before his throne. That is what sets us apart, that we recognize that God is deserving of our thanksgiving. And then we can say with the psalmist in Psalm 92.1, it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. Let's close in prayer. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for everything you have done for us. We thank you for not just the, the trials that we face that you build us with, that you build our character with, Lord, but we also thank you for your sustaining power, for getting us through those trials. Lord, we thank you for the rich heritage that we have here in this country, a heritage of, of Christian belief, a heritage of those who came through the fire in order to, to bring your word and your gospel to this land, a land of freedom, Lord. May we be thankful for that. Lord, just may this week, above all weeks, we remember to be thankful to you for everything in everything. Guide and direct us now throughout this day and the rest of this day, Lord. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Wouldn't it be good if all of our public officials had this kind of message, this thought? Kevin, thank you for that. That was just really good and uh, something that we need to live and practice every day. Um, in two weeks, we are going to have our annual business meeting where we approve the budget and also approve the trustees for the uh, next coming year. And so as you leave, the ushers will hand you a, a paper that's got the budget on the back end and then also who the trustees are going to be and our deacons. And so you can take those and look them over. If you've got some questions, you can ask one of those guys and they'd probably be able to help you. Uh, uh, Ken Kyle and Paul Fisher are really the two that put the budget together. So, uh, you know, they can give you probably a little more specifics, but uh, uh, God has just blessed us. And as the lesson today, Thanksgiving, what a difficult year this has been. 2020 has been very difficult. It's not over yet, and who knows what else is going to happen. But God is still on the throne. God is in your heart. God is going to protect you, direct you, guide you, lead you. Uh, he is there, so uh, we need to praise Him for that. Don't forget, tonight we're going to be continuing the movie. I think you'll really enjoy it. Even if you didn't see the first part, you will enjoy this. We're dismissed. <laughs>